welcome to our documentary on food in the Bible, or as we like to call, a culinary tour of the Bible. I'm Josh. Hey, I'm Matt. And together, with the help of some of our friends, we'd like to explore what the Bible says about food. Now, documentaries about food are really popular today. There's those documentaries that explore the dangers of eating fast food. And today, we're counting down our picks for the top 10 outrageous fast food items. For this list, we're looking at food choices from around the world. The documentaries that explore how foods are made and what foods are healthy. I give you 100% grass-fed corn. Mmm. Grass-fed corn? There are cooking shows. Then there are those wilderness documentaries like we saw from Pastor Greg last week that explore being in the wilderness and eating those really scary things. This documentary will explore none of those things. We'll be looking at the role of food in the Bible and the role of food throughout Christian history. I thought it would be interesting to begin by asking some people what they remember that the Bible says about food. Yeah. What, what foods does the Bible say that you can eat? To be honest with you, I'm not sure. <laughs> Are there any foods the Bible says that we should eat? Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Popcorn. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I always think about uh, fish uh, in the sea and different herbs and spices like um, horseradish and... Well, there's the whole kosher system, but we don't really follow the kosher system necessarily. To begin our journey of exploring food in the Bible, we need to go back to the very beginning. Genesis, in fact. Let's hear what Genesis has to say about food. God said, See, I have given you every plant-yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Wait a minute. Does that scripture mean that we should all really be vegetarians? There are biblical scholars that interpret this scripture that God's original intent was that we would all be vegetarian. But... And then there was that whole Adam and Eve and the apple thing. Hey Josh, that wasn't really an apple, was it? To explore the history of food in the Bible is to also explore the history of the Israelite people. In Genesis, we read about God creating the heavens and the earth. God creates humankind. We then read about the flood. And then we go on to read about the covenant made between God and Abraham. After Abraham, we read about Isaac and Jacob and the twelve tribes of Israel, their enslavement in Egypt, their exodus in the wilderness. And there we read about holy manna from heaven. <laughs> holy manna. Manna was that special food that God provided for the Israelite people while they were hungry in the wilderness. As their time wandering in the wilderness is about to end, God reminds Moses of the covenant made between God and Abraham, reminding him of the promised land they will soon reach. The Lord said to Moses, Go, leave this place, you and the people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and go to the land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants I will give it. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14 contain the list of what the Bible designates as clean foods and unclean foods. Those clean foods happen to be Antelope, buffalo, caribou, cattle, deer, elk, gazelle, giraffe, goat, heart, moose, ox, reindeer, sheep, chicken, dove, duck, goose, grouse, partridge, pheasant, pigeon, prairie chicken, quail, sparrow, swan, turkey, 
Clean insects, such as locusts, crickets, and grasshoppers. Clean fish, such as albacore, anchovies, bass, bluebacks, bluefish, bluegill, carp, grouper, herring, mullet, shad, silver egg, Spanish mackerel, steelhead, sergeant fish, sole, striped bass, sunfish, trout, tuna, whitefish, white flounder, yellowtail, and yellow perch. Those are just to name a few. And then we have the unclean list. Those animals start with unclean land animals. Armadillo, badger, bear, beaver, boar, camel, cat, cheetah, coyote, dog, donkey, elephant, fox, gorilla, groundhog, hare, hippopotamus, horse, hyena, kangaroo, leopard, lion, mole, monkey, mouse, mule, muskrat, possum, panther, pigs, porcupines, rabbits, raccoons, rats, skunks, slugs, snails, squirrels, tigers, wallabies, weasels, wolverines, wolves, worms, and zebras. The unclean birds, the albatross, bat, buzzard, condor, crane, crow, cuckoo, eagle, flamingo, gull, hawk, Kite, loon, ostrich, owl, parrot, pelican, penguin, rail, raven, roadrunner, stork, swallow, swift, vulture, hen, woodpecker. And then all insects except some in the locust family. Reptiles and amphibians such as alligators, blind worms, crocodiles, frogs, lizards, newts, salamanders, snakes, toads, and turtles. And unclean fish such as catfish, clams, crabs, crayfish, cuttlefish, dolphins, eels, lobsters, marlin, mussels, octopus, oysters, cuttlefish, prawn, scallops, seals, sharks, shrimps, swordfish, and whale. Whew. That's a lot of animals. So what determines whether an animal falls on the clean list or the unclean list? Biblical scholars have been looking at this for years. Some note that the animals that fall on the clean list tend to be the animals that are thought to be healthy for human consumption, and the animals that fall on the unclean list tend to be the animals thought to be unfit for human consumption. We also note that the animals that are on the unclean list tend to be the animals that are more scavenger-like. For example, wolves or cheetahs. We also note that the fish tend to be the bottom feeders. Shellfish like shrimp or oysters. Many Hebrew Bible scholars note that the God of the Hebrew Bible tends to be depicted as a God of order. A God that brings order out of chaos. A God that separates the sea from the land, the day from the night. And if we look at these foods that are found in the clean list versus the unclean list, we can also see that sense of order. The food laws we read about, in addition to many of the other laws that we read throughout the Pentateuch, that God gave to Moses to give to the Israelite people, helped create a sense of community. Especially a community during a time when this group was wandering in the wilderness. Many Hebrew Bible scholars believe that much of the Hebrew Bible was composed during the time of the exile, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just yet. After wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, the Israelite people finally settled in that land of milk and honey. But after King David and Solomon, it wouldn't be long before the Israelite people were forced into exile once more. And during this exile, it was those laws that binded those communities together when they did not have a common home. During the time of exile, one of the ways the Israelite people held on to their cultural identity was through their eating habits. We read about this in Daniel. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the royal rations of food and wine, so he asked the palace master to allow him not to defile himself. Now God allowed Daniel to receive favor and compassion from the palace master. The palace master said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king. He has appointed your food and drink. If he should see you in poorer condition than any other men of your own age, you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel asked the guard whom the palace master had appointed over Daniel, Please test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. You can then compare our appearance with the appearance of the young men who eat the royal rations and deal with your servants according to what you observe. So he agreed to this proposal and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, it was observed that they appeared better and fatter than all the young men who had been eating the royal rations. So the guard continued to withdraw their royal rations and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. While it was true for the Israelites during exile, 
while it was true for many of the immigrant communities moving into the United States, and while it is still true today, food can help us have a cultural identity. Food can bring us together. Food can also separate us. Upon the Israelites' return to Jerusalem from exile, it wouldn't be long before a Palestinian Jew would incite a huge paradigm shift in cultural identity, and food played a major role in this. We read throughout the New Testament of Jesus' ministry and how much of that ministry takes place around mealtimes. Food was a way in which Jesus brought together community. In many ways, Jesus used mealtime to break down social barriers and boundaries and bring together community. How did he do that, Pastor Greg? I think seriously, Jesus was eating with the outcasts of society, which was a big deal. You know, he was eating with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the people who were generally looked down upon by society. And so when he's eating with them, he's sending a message that people are included, openness to all, if you will. And wasn't it cool they gathered around a table to do it? Jesus saw food as a way to bring people together. Let's listen to what Jesus said. Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. After Jesus' death and resurrection, we read in Acts about Peter's dream that changes everything. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. This dream, which was mainly about food, is what many consider to be the birth of Christianity. Now, both Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus could worship together. It's important to note that Peter's dream did not abolish the former laws instructed by Moses, but rather it brought together the Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus in community. But this wasn't always easy, as we read about in Romans. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. New Testament scholarship suggests that Paul was addressing a very real concern between those Gentile followers of Jesus and those Jewish followers of Jesus in the church in Rome at that time. The Jewish followers of Jesus were often looked down upon by those Gentile followers of Jesus because they were still observing their Jewish traditions on eating habits. Paul was instructing those Gentile believers to not pass judgment on their Jewish counterparts, but rather to come together in love and community. So what's the point of all this? Or, as Pastor Greg likes to say, Idai, so what? That's a great question, Pastor Greg. I believe that food should be something that brings us together. Food can create community. Food can also create division. We see in our culture how eating habits and food can create division between ethnicities, between social class, and between ages. While there's plenty out there that can tear us apart, I believe that food should be something that can bring us together, that we should be thinking about extending our tables of community. So you're saying we should extend our tables of community? When making food choices, we can think about choosing foods that are good for the environment and good for community. 
We can also think about ways in which we can invite others into our community through food. I challenge you this week to think about how food can create barriers to community and can create community in your world. How can you break down those barriers? And how can you fully extend your table to those who maybe you wouldn't normally extend them to? Perhaps you may even find that sketchy person that you might invite to your table of community. <laughs>